Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this, our lecture for Module 10, Worlds of Unease. Now, I just want to say, sort of as a heads up, I think this is one of the best um, uh, modules that we do in this class. I think it's just a really fascinating and interesting uh, examination and look at um, some of the critical issues that uh, relate to the power of our identity and identification with the state. That said, I think the chapter is also one of the most challenging chapters that we have to deal with um, in our reading. So I just want to put you guys on notice that um, we uh, have this uh, rather difficult subject matter to deal with. But my job and my task uh, in this lecture is to try to navigate you all through the mire of this readings. And so rather than my usual style where I kind of go off the beaten track sometimes um, to bring in other anecdotes and interesting things that I think might be interesting for you as we go along the way, in, I, I'm not going to do too much of that in this lecture. I'm going to try to stick pretty much straight straight with the, um, with the uh, chapter be because I think it's a good chapter and I think it's worth getting it right. That's my basic point. So, so, um, so how does the nation state work? How does the nation state crucially um, come to have us believe that we are part of it, right? How does it persuade us that we are part of its nation? Uh, specifically, you know, um, how do Irish people come to take being Irish and living in Ireland for granted? How do American people come to take being American and living in America for granted? What makes us American? What makes us Irish or Australian or Japanese? Um, what, what, what stories about ourselves do we have to forget if, if we're going to spend so much time remembering we're American or Irish or Japanese, right? So there's, there's things at stake here. And also there's history at stake because the state, historically speaking, has had a harder time of late um, with uh, this question of memory. And, um, you know, as I always remind you guys, the one date that I urge you all to remember in this class is 1648, the Treaty of Westphalia. And um, the Treaty of Westphalia is important because it sort of, as a date I think we discussed, marks this occasion where we sort of started to turn our back on God, right? And so we had a, a sort of a death of God in some ways. Some people react to that term um, and, and that's fine. But, you know, we don't li mean the literal death of God. What we really mean is the separation of church and state. And so one of the themes, especially later on in this class, is going to be um, the question of how the death of God or how the separation of church and state um, affects uh, our ability to understand who we are, right? If, if we're God's people living together in one country that's ordained by God, um, then, um, you know, the state has an easier time making us whole together. But if God is dead, if, the, if God is no longer part of what the state does, then it's harder for us to feel a sense of identity. Um, and then a second dimension to this is, of course, more recently still, globalization. How does globalization and the sense of identity from globalization affect who we are and how we relate to ourselves and what we think ourselves to be? So, so really there's some um, good stuff coming up. Um, and, and, and also in this lecture, we have the question of resistance and how, um, how some literary narratives, especially, um, can try to change or submerge or affect um, some of the things we're talking about here. So without any further ado, let's move on. So the question um, that Michael Shapiro, our author, uh, for the chapter, um, 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 for this, for this um, module, is putting on the table is the relationship between the nation and the state um, and, and ultimately modernity, right? So actually modern political thought has been fairly um, obsessed and preoccupied with uh, the question of the nation and the state. And they are different things. We talk about them together as if they're one thing, but if we think about it, break it down, the nation and the state are actually quite different things. Um, on the one hand, we have the question of the state uh, itself. And, and that question is, as we've discussed many times before, if we go back all the way to Max Weber's definition of sovereignty, which was back, I think, in week one or week two, um, we know that the state as an entity is, 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 a, is a regime of power that exists over a certain jurisdiction and it asserts a legitimate monopoly over the forces of violence that are available within the state, i.e. the army. And if someone else raises an army in our country, we generally have a civil war because no state really wants to admit or concede or accept 
um, that uh, another uh, army should, uh, official army can exist in the same state. Um, there can only be one army, and so long as there's only one army, we can say there's one state. Now, the question of the nation, however, is not really to do with space. It's not really to do with territory. It's more to do with what we're calling time. So I feel the author Shapiro is suggesting here that, that the, the time dimension is actually much more complex than the territorial dimensions. And um, it's, it's, it, 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 when he talks about time, he relates it to the idea of binding people to a shared sense of destiny. And of course, that's, destiny is something that's in the future. It's, some, it's, a de, it's a place in time as opposed to a place in a physical place, but it's a place in time or a time that we will arrive at together as a people. So think about it this way, right? Um, if the state is to do with a, a literal territory, the nation is to do with a common journey of the people who live within that territory, right? And this is the, the way that we make people feel that they are um, sort of naturally belonging together. Because if you think about it, there's no real such thing as a natural people, even in the oldest countries on earth, right? The, those people are not natural. They all came from somewhere. There was nobody, or uh, no, nobody is originally from anywhere, right? All peoples all over the earth, if you go back long enough, migrated where they are from somewhere else. Um, originally, we're all um, uh, evolving and migrating from Africa. So maybe we're all Africans in that regards. Um, but this creates a problem, this idea of a lack of an origin, right? Uh, how can we make people feel that they belong together in one nation when we have so much evidence that they don't really come from there? Um, they have to have a myth of their past, right? The state has to create for them a myth of their past, their present and their future, i.e. their destiny. So for a people to exist, there has to be an invention of this timeline, a past, a present, and a future, or a tradition. We can call it a, tra a tradition or a common story, even a history, right? A history. Um, so people um, need that, and, and the state recognizes this. This is people uh, are insecure, I suppose, especially in modern times with the death of God, as we've been saying, that there's no real sense of what exactly it is that life is for if the nation state can come along and give people a sense of meaning and purpose, um, a sense of their common hit story or history, um, then it will, then it will, you know, probably be able to provide that thing that people feel is missing in their lives. Um, earlier in the semester, we talked about uh, subconscious ideology and subconscious ideology is this concept we looked at um, that, that it's about, it's about the things that we don't know that we know, right? the little bits of baggage that we keep with us, that, that sort of travel with us um, without our thinking about them. They go without saying. Um, so how do people come to think of their history as going without saying? How do people come to think of their relationship to the nation state as going without saying? I think those are the questions we're looking at this week. And Shapiro's answer to this question is that the invention of tradition, uh, the invention of history, the invention of a common destiny, our common timeline, all involves uh, what we call cultural governance. That is to say, the use uh, by the government of a series of cultural practices, whether they be ceremonies, national holidays, museum, museum displays, etc., um, all to bring us together and to make us sort of celebrate together and observe together um, physically um, these moments. So, so for example, um, Thanksgiving is a very American holiday. It's not really celebrated anywhere else in the world, but um, you know, Americans all travel to see their families, and it's something they do together on this day. So um, that's a what that's one way to be American, and it's one way for ever, for us all to sort of attest to our American heritage, our American uh, common destiny by participating in this chronological event, right? This event in time that gives us meaning. So. Um, if, however, the time and the space of our nation state is just ceremonial, if it's just habitual or practice based, um, that we're all just basically reading from the same storybook every time we do these things, um, which, ex which exerts, as, as Shapiro calls it, centripetal force, which brings us together, isn't it plausible in the same breath that there would be stories that take us apart, that, 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 that are uh, centrifugal? 
in their nature. So centripetal brings us inwards, centrifugal brings us outwards. And, and, and so, it, you know, for all of these ceremonies and these events that, that might bring us together, for all of these common stories and, and especially artwork and literature, we've looked at a lot of that in this course, um, that brings us together, it's plausible that there's also counter uh, narratives. And, and it's to those, I think, that we want to turn our attention um, in this class. Now on this slide, I said I wouldn't go off the beaten track too much with you in this class, but I did want to stop in and look at this slide at least. Now, this is a piece of artwork from my one of my favorite movies called Blade Runner. And um, this is one of the storyboards from the movie. And I just wanted to show it to you here because it's, it's kind of interesting. If you watch the movie, the, you'll see the movie is full of scenes just like this one, street scenes, where you see all kinds of different ethnic um, representations, Japanese, Chinese, American, English, Italian, German uh, uh, people speaking, walking the streets, um, living a very futuristic lifestyle in this science fiction utopian vision, or some people would say dystopian vision, of um, Los Angeles um, in the year 2018, I think it is. Um, I'll leave the details of the storyline aside because they're not really relevant for us. But I am interested in this slide in so far as it speaks to a concept that Shapiro uh, offers to us, which is the concept of the ethnoscape on page 222. Now, Shapiro says that an ethnoscape is a landscape of diverse ethnic subjects. That, And his point really is that all landscapes, all human landscapes, contain diverse ethnic subjects, diverse identity claims. And um, he chooses the example of a movie to show how a city can contain an ethnoscape, right? Cities are very interesting things because just as in the representation in this image, um, the urban space um, uh, has huge diversity in it really. By definition, it's a, it's a diverse space. And um, especially if you go to New York or Los Angeles, you see um, evidence of waves and waves of immigrants of all different colors from all different kinds of countries all over the world. And you hear lots of different languages being spoken. No matter which uh, city it is around the world, cities look alike, whether it's London, Delhi, Tokyo, Los Angeles. I think what the image that I'm showing you here in this slide suggests is that all cities start to bleed into each other. They all look alike. And one of the questions I think that uh, we um, would, would, would ask about this is how this kind of imagination of the urban space um, speaks to the, the, the cacophony, the diversity of voices, the sheer intensity and range and frenesity of the voices that, that exist here. How do these voices, this diversity, how does it speak to the desire of the nation state to hold together as one when it contains all this diversity? Now let's talk a little bit more about ethnoscapes. So in this slide, um, having just set out the idea that artwork and cities and various other um, parts of, of, of our ethnoscape can, um, can, can be upsetting or difficult for the nation state to manage and control in terms of setting its preferred frame of reference for the population. Um, we should look at a really interesting case study here that's discussed by Shapiro. Um, Shapiro notes um, that these odd people in our ethnoscapes are often attempted to be sort of um, uh, frozen out of history or forgotten out of history. And, um, and indeed, if you look at the image in the present slide, um, arguably that's one um, effort that's going on in, in the representation here. Um, so Shapiro turns to the novelist Jamaica Kincaid to help make this point in this analysis of this painting, which is John Trumbull's famous 1816 painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Jamaica Kincaid is a descendant of slaves from Antigua. And um, when she looks at this painting, and the painting really is one that many Americans celebrate, it's uh, this moment of US history um, where the country is effectively established, but she um, doesn't look on the painting as a celebration. She looks at the painting as something perhaps a little bit different. Uh, she looks at it differently because when she gazes at the painting, what she sees basically are a lot of white faces. 
and and she wants to ask the question how is it that these men look so comfortable and so rested you know they're they're sort of they're there in their fine uh, dress they're 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 wearing their powdered wigs um, they're sitting back comfortably they're um, they're gentlemen of letters so to speak right they're obviously very well educated clean clothes um, she wants to ask the question, you know, um, if, if, if all that's in this painting are white faces, how come uh, they had the time to become like this, right? You know, how, how come life was so easy for them uh, that they would able, be able to come into this grand hall here with their education and their powdered wigs and, um, and sign this declaration? How is it that, that that's possible? Um, as she says, historically, um, their ease, their comfort, their cleanliness um, was all really um, because they didn't have to do the labor that was saved for them by slaves, by having slaves. So really, Jamaica Kincaid's point when she looks at this painting is where are the slaves, right? That's central to the founding of the Declaration of Independence was a holding uh, of slaves and the labor of slaves. And the lives of these men would have been much more difficult without those slaves. So in this way, her analysis of this painting disrupts the idea of what the founding of the United States was about, because effectively her painting is precisely what we're talking about here, a counter-narrative. So folks, I want you to keep this painting in mind uh, today as we go through this lecture, um, because the key point of this lecture really is the same point that Jamaica Kincaid's making in her analysis of the painting, that our, our art and our literature um, our official art and literature, the, the art and literature that we celebrate as being American or Irish or Japanese or Australian, you know, in an official sense, right, is often about forgetting as much as it is about representing. Um, every country has to remember certain things about its founding in order for it to make it seem like we have a common destiny together. And every country has to forget the challenges to that narrative. That, that, that there are people who are maybe oppressed or suppressed by the founding of the state, um, as in this case, the, the African-American slaves. So it's in that forgetting, um, Michael Shapiro was arguing, and I think Jamaica Kincaid is arguing, um, that, um, that, that th this silencing, this forgetting of history, that we see, I think, um, the power of narrative, okay? This is this idea that Stories only tell one side, and the official history um, is really quite problematic at the end of the day because it only tells this one side of the story. So in this next slide now, um, we try to get into some more detail about um, the official history of the nation state. And here, um, Michael uh, Shapiro turns to the work of Pierre Bourdieu, to try to find out why it can be so hard to imagine who we are without our hi story, right? Without our history, um, the story that we tell ourselves about where we're coming from and where we're going to our common destiny. So here it might be a good idea to think back a couple of lectures ago to what we were talking about in the previous uh, module or two when we were, um, we were invoking um, Foucault and his story about the head of the king and Slavoj Žižek and his story about the hole in the flag. Both of those moments, in a way, theoretically speaking at least, uh, were ways that those thinkers were making the same point that we're making really today. That without our story, we don't really know who we are. We're the ones that keep the head on the king in our minds because we are the ones invested in the nation state with our hearts and with our brains. And Zizek saying that, you know, there is nothing really there in the middle of the flag. All flags have holes in the middle. Um, and, it, and the only way uh, we don't see it uh, their hollowness, the hollowness of the nation state, is by believing that it's not there. So Pierre Bourdieu is uh, a theorist and a scholar who takes this idea very, very seriously. He asks the question, are we trapped by the game of our national his story, right? And he says in a quote here that's offered by Michael Shapiro, to think the state is to risk being taken over by a thought of the state. Um, so, you know, the, the, once we have the state itself, the very concept of the state invites a forgetting of the costs and expenses of setting up that state in terms of the freedom for a great many people. All states have this problem, he's arguing, not just the United States, all states around the world. Um, 
But we don't really think about the thought of the state as being an expense or a cost in terms of our memory because we all live in the European-oriented model of political order. Everyone in the world now, the whole world over, lives in in a state. Um, and the model of the state, the modern state, of course, started in Europe, and it's been exported all over the world by European settlers and colonists, whether it was here in the United States or elsewhere. Um, all nation states today have to live um, according to this project, and they only exist by whim and uh, or by virtue of the fact that this project existed historically. Um, so for Bourdieu, who is our scholar here in the picture, um, it is interesting to look at the field of literature to try to see how it is that we might be able to challenge, and indeed many novelists and authors do challenge, the rules of the game set up by the European-oriented model of political order. And um, Bourdieu says that one way to try to read literature to see how literature relates to the space and the time of the nation state is to think about what he calls the spatio-temporal field within which novels, novelists actually do their work. What is the, what is the spatio-temporal field that they are creating through their writing? This is important, he says, because normally we tend to think of novelists in terms of their influences biographically speaking, right? So, you know, oh, this person read such and such and was taught by such and such, so therefore their novels are this part of this, that, or the other tradition. But, Sh but, um, but, but Shapiro and um, Bourdieu are trying to sort of create a different point. They're saying that instead of that, we should probably go looking more at the role of time and space in the, in the writings. So that might sound a little bit abstract, but maybe we can make it more clear. Um, so why might we focus on time and space? Well, uh, the ideas of time and space can tell us a lot about how the author is sticking to the official history of the world they live in, or alternatively, trying to break with it, right? The way time and space are portrayed in a novel can tell us a lot about the relationship of the conjecture of that novel to the official history. And we need to think about this kind of carefully because um, in some ways, you know, it's not unusual for novelists to get a little bit critical about the state of the world around them. I mean, do you, has anyone ever read a novel where the novelist wasn't a little bit critical of the world around them, right? And so it's not unusual for novelists to use their writing to deliver a kind of a political message, but that's not quite what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is something a little bit deeper. We're talking about the idea that perhaps a novelist could be critical not just of how people play the game of politics, but perhaps critical of the game of politics itself. Um, that is to say, the way politics makes us fit within a certain time and a certain space. And and that is, I think, where um, where Bourdieu is trying to take us. That that we we can in this class, if we are interested, uh, and and the and the the, the chapter. Um, for this uh, module talks about three different authors who from different standpoints try to challenge the rules of the game through their writing. These are authors who refuse to take the nation state for granted and who use their writings to try to remind us of how the continued existence of the nation state also, as we've been discussing, implies a certain forgetting of how it came to be in the first place and a forgetting too of the real costs of its continued existence. So another way to express this, by the way, if you sort of want the Nick Kiersey version of this, is, you know, well, liberals and conservatives, we know they disagree with each other. We know they both believe that we can choose our political destiny. But at the end of the day, how much freedom do we really have um, would be the question, right? Liberals and conservatives think that we have lots of choices. We can be liberal, we can be conservative. But at the end of the day, their choices are within a margin. And the question of true and authentic freedom is about perhaps stepping outside that margin, which is the margin established by the time and the space of the state, to ask a bigger question, which is, no matter where in the world we live, why is it that we are forced to live in a state? Why is it that all the people of the world today have to live within this European model of political order? So what do we say then to people who want freedom from this space and this time of the state? What do we say to people who um, think 
uh, differently about the requirement that modern life makes upon them to make such narrow choices, to be a liberal or to be a conservative? What if I don't want to be either? What if I don't want to live in a nation state? Not, not just America or Ireland or Australia, but none of them. I want to live outside of an officially sanctioned history. Um, is that possible today? Um, arguably, it's not. The nation state was invented in Europe um, and, and we are today as descendants of this European project, people who are sort of in a European prison or in a European jail. Um, and, and, it, and it seems that we cannot escape it, despite globalization, despite all these things that we think are going on and changing the world around us. The state is a continuing uh, reality for all of us, and there's no way out. So, um, in the next few slides, we have three um, authors. Um, these are the authors that Shapiro details, who try to offer um, a challenge to the logic of the nation state, this European project, as we've been calling it. Um, and the first of these authors is Michelle Cliff. And she asks this, uh, the question, the primary question, and they all ask this question, I suppose. If the language of the nation state is a trap, if it's a European prison, as we called it just a moment ago, how do we avoid it? How do we get out of it? Um, if if uh, we look at the common thread that runs through the next three authors, we'll find that, that this is the question. So I think the question that Michelle Cliff is trying to put on the table is... Um, whether it is uh, uh, possible to, um, to speak, to write, and use language in a way that challenges the state. Because if you think about it, language itself is official, right? The state doesn't allow us to speak just any old language. If I take my exam to be a medical doctor, and I write it in my own makeup language, it, I won't get uh, a grade and I won't get my degree. Um, I won't be able to become a medical doctor. Um, similarly, if I want to become a CIA or FBI employee, uh, an, an agent, or if I want to run for president, I can't use my own language. I have to use the language of the state, the official recognized language of the state. And there is one. I mean, in America, it's English, right? So it's American English. Um, so, so this is the question Michelle Cliff, I think, is asking. You know, if, if the language of the nation state is a trap, then is it possible that literature, because it uses that language, is itself fundamentally statist? And that's a kind of a paradoxical question, for, especially for a novelist to ask, because, well, you know, how do we uh, go about the business of being a novelist if we can't use language? It's, it's impossible to do that. So um, the example of Cliff's novel, which is uh, Free Enterprise, is uh, perhaps that silence itself might be an option for us. So the characters in Cliff's novels um, show us uh, that languages play an important role. Um, in her novels, the European languages do a lot of work, for example. They are part of the official way that government businesses run. Um, in her novels, which sort of focus in on areas of, of the old slave trade, um, the African languages are not part of official language, right? They are they are left marginalized. They're not they're not part of official government business, and that makes sense, right? So, um, so th this is significant for us because what we see is that the nation state here isn't just governing over a territory, as in asking people for their passports and whatnot. It's actually governing over the way people act, the way people speak, the way people even think and communicate. So the worldview of the state um, are what some philosophers call ontology. That's a word we've used before, O-N-T-O-L-O-G-Y, ontology, um, which is the way we think or imagine our being in the world, um, that the state actually is an ontological actor because it intervenes and acts on our worldview, um, our language, our speech, um, our way of relating to ourselves and to each other, all of this in a sense is mediated and, and regulated and sanctioned by the state. And if we, if we, if we um, you know, if, if we go against the grain of the state, whether in terms of its technical laws um, or its in cultural habits and practices, we will find ourselves marginalized. And that's what Cliff is trying to sort of explore and navigate here, is the question of how 
maybe we can um, do some counter practices here, you know, to open up spaces uh, where we have space to think critically and di to gain some distance from the state um, and its ontological practices. So Shapiro cites Cliff as a writer who tries to resist the ontological colonization of our minds by the state, footnote, the European state project. So for Cliff, it seems that um, one way you can even try to resist the state is through silence um, or aphasia, which is a useful strategy, she seems to think. Why? Because, well, with the condition of aphasia, uh, you cannot understand or be understood by other people. Thus the condition, by definition, breaks or ruptures with the world around us. Her character in her novels, Kitty Savage, tries to be silent politically, right? Because if we are silent, we're not complicit in the reproduction of the ontology of the state, the official ontology of the state. So, I mean, to me, that seems like a very interesting and viable um, alternative. Um, uh, but I also think, and I think Shapiro is saying this too, that in the long run, it might be possible for one person to do this, but as a broader sort of political strategy, it leaves us vulnerable. Um, so Cliff's argument in this sense seems to sort of contradict itself, because after all, if language is so problematic, then um, then then how does um, writing about someone who is silent in this way um, um, carry through the commitment that she's uh, issuing in her work seemingly to this idea of aphasia, right? Isn't she contradicting by sitting down and writing a novel about aphasia, the concept of aphasia as a viable platform of resistance? You know, she recognizes that she still needs to get the message out there and to get the message out there she still has to use the language of the state. So I think there's a problem there in some ways. Um, but nevertheless, it, uh, it is interesting. It's an interesting thought experiment. And perhaps for her, um, after all, uh, she's just a novelist. She's not really necessarily into politics. Um, silence is just an experimental ideal. It's used simply to give us a sense of the stakes and the risks of engaging in writing in the first place. So we'll end the first part of this lecture here. And um, I'll be back in just a moment with part two.